Cocaine and methamphetamines are well-known psychoactive drugs, but today we'll be extracting the world's most popular psychoactive drug, caffeine from tea leaves, and we'll see how pure we can get it. Like many other people, caffeine is my favorite drug. People enjoy caffeine mainly because of its stimulant properties, and how it inhibits the chemical responsible for sleepiness, called adenosine. You can make caffeine in the lab, but this is overly complicated when plants biosynthesize it. The most common known caffeine producer is the coffee plant, producing caffeine as a natural defense from bugs and other plants. This socially accepted psychoactive compound is found in many other plants as well, such as tea leaves. Some plants use caffeine to drug bees into wanting them to come back and grab their pollen. By giving a reward of drugs, the bees are pavloved by the plants into helping them breed. Talk about a wingman. First things first, we need a plant high in caffeine. Black tea contains some of the highest amounts of caffeine. Specifically, I will use Lapsang Sushang. I opened a bag of dry tea leaves and poured them into a flask. After transferring some of the tea leaves, I quickly noticed that I had grossly undersized my flask. After switching that out for a bigger one, we can continue. The first step of extraction is to remove the caffeine from the solid tea leaves. By heating in water, we can extract water-soluble compounds such as tannic acid, which is responsible for the bitterness of coffee and tea, while also extracting caffeine that we want. I boiled the leaves in a flask while stirring for about an hour. This produces one of the worst cups of tea. It smells of fresh cedar wood. Next, we filtered the solution to remove any insoluble particles, such as tea leaves and tiny fragments that have broken off while stirring. I used a large Buchner funnel on a vacuum flask. To speed up filtering, I applied a vacuum. This process was still prolonged and took a few hours to complete. I also washed the leaves a few times to ensure as much caffeine was transferred as possible. The aqueous solution coming through the funnel is a dark brown color, thanks to tannic acid. Hopefully it contains our caffeine as well. We have a lot of liquid volume, which is annoying to work with. To solve this, I'll boil off some of the excess water to reduce the volume down to about 1.5 liters. Due to 1.5 liters being much easier to work with than nearly 3 liters of liquid. So the current problem is that we have an aqueous solution containing many organic compounds, but we only want caffeine out of it. Unfortunately, we can't just take the caffeine from the solution but we can remove caffeine along with a few other organics using a method called liquid-liquid extraction. We can use a solvent that can dissolve caffeine better than the water while also not mixing with the water. An organic solvent that works great for this is dichloromethane. Caffeine is very soluble in dichloromethane and the methane won't mix with the water. I transferred the tea solution to a 2000 milliliter separatory funnel. and poured in around 250 milliliters of dichloromethane. I then cap the funnel. The next step is to mix the dichloromethane with the tea extract gently. We want a lot of contact for the caffeine to move into the organic solvent, but an emulsion will form if we shake it too violently, which is terrible due to the emulsion trapping impurities. After mixing, I place the separatory funnel back into the ring and allow the organic layer to separate from the aqueous layer. Quickly, I notice three layers, which is annoying. The middle layer is the undesired emulsion. Fortunately, it's small enough not to affect the extraction much. Once the layers had separated, I transferred the bottom organic layer into a flask. Dichloromethane is a lovely solvent, but it's not the best for your health and the environment. So we, as green chemists, can collect and reuse the solvent. A simple distillation is used to do this. Dichloromethane boils at a relatively low temperature, so distillation goes quickly, and we are left with two flasks. One contains our extract, and the other the clean solvent. The method we used to extract the caffeine also extracted many other organic compounds, evident by our caffeine's product greenish-yellow color. We need to remove these and precisely extract the caffeine from the extraction material. To do this, I will try a few methods. The first is sublimation directly after extraction. The caffeine is a remarkable molecule not only because of the stimulant property, but because it has the attractive sublimation property. By heating caffeine, we can cause it to go from a solid directly to a gaseous state 
without it needing to melt in between. We can then condense the gas back into a solid, giving us pure caffeine. This works because other materials won't be able to boil off the same way that caffeine does at such low temperatures. I took some of the material and placed it into a vacuum flask on a hot plate. The flask is sealed using what's known as a cold finger. During sublimation, this will give caffeine a place to condense. I then started the vacuum pump, which was hooked up to the vacuum flask. Once a high enough vacuum was reached, I started the cold water flowing through the cold finger. I did it in this order to make sure no condensation forms on the cold finger. If condensation forms, this could cause the caffeine not to stick during sublimation. I then started heating the hot plate, which led to the sublimation of the caffeine. Caffeine sublimates around 178 degrees Celsius, and due to a vacuum being pulled, sublimation will occur at lower temperature due to changing in vapor pressures. Shortly after heating begins, we notice that the caffeine sticks to the side of the flask and onto the cold finger itself. This shows that the caffeine sublimation is working. It stuck to the side of the glass a bit more than I wanted to, so I ended up wrapping the flask with aluminum foil to keep in the heat and after some time, most of the caffeine sublimated to the cold finger. I removed the cold finger from the vacuum flask and washed it off using dichloromethane into a beaker. The product in this case was mildly yellow, most likely since oils in the extraction process could evaporate off at low temperatures, just as the caffeine did. I then allowed the dichloromethane to evaporate off, leaving us with a yellow powder. The next purification method I'll try is recrystallization. By creating a saturated solution of caffeine in a warm solution, and then decreasing the solubility of the caffeine in that solution, we can cause the caffeine to crystallize out, giving us a pure product. The crystallization of caffeine out of the solution will leave behind any impurities in the solvent we use. I begin by heating some acetone, our solvent, for recrystallization. Once the acetone starts to boil, I transfer it to another beaker that contains our extraction product. I continue to add warm acetone till all has dissolved. We want to use as little acetone as possible to mitigate how much caffeine remains after crystallization, once the solvent cools down. Next I add a few drops of petroleum ether. An exciting thing occurs here, acetone by itself can dissolve caffeine quite well, but by mixing it with petroleum ether the solubility of caffeine in the solution drops rapidly, causing it to precipitate out. I then allowed the beaker to cool back down to room temperature. Once cool, all the caffeine should have crystallized out, leaving us with a solution of impurities and a solid caffeine product. I then performed a vacuum filtration and washed the crystallized caffeine with cold petroleum ether acetone mix. This left us with a nice clean caffeine powder, with only a slight tinge to it. For the final purification, I redid the sublimation this time with the newly crystallized product. This hopefully has removed most of the oils to give us a more pure product. I repeated all the same steps as discussed previously, but this time I did it with a different material. Once I began heating, you can slowly see the chunk of caffeine start to sublimate and stick to the cold finger. After some time, all the caffeine had sublimated and just a black residue was left over. I took the cold finger out once again and rinsed it with dichloromethane. After all the solvent had evaporated, we are left with excellent white crystal structure at the bottom of the beaker. One way to judge purity is on crystal size. This is because any impurities in the material will cause sites for crystals to grow. So if there's low sites for crystals to grow, there's low impurities in the solution, leading to larger crystal formation. Now that we have all purification methods complete, I weighed out each material and we extracted around 700 milligrams of caffeine in total. This is far lower than the few grams that I expected. The caffeine I didn't extract is probably still in the initial tea extract and spread out through the glassware. I was by far no means quantitative for this extraction. Now let's analyze each sample and see how pure each one is. The first method I will use is known as melting point analysis. This is one of the simplest methods for analyzing a sample. All the apparatus is, is a thermometer on a heating block. I load each of the four samples into what are known as capillary tubes. These are small glass tubes that we will place inside the melting point apparatus. 
it doesn't take much material to fill up these tubes. I want to ensure I get all the material down to the bottom of the tube. By lightly tapping the material, it'll fall down to the bottom. Due to the caffeine wanting to sublimate instead of melting, I filled up the capillary tubes higher than what is usually needed to create a seal to allow the caffeine to melt. I then loaded two samples with pure caffeine to judge the melting points and act as standards when we do analysis. Now I could use this manual melting point analysis instrument, or I can use the automatic one. I chose the automatic one because I did not want to sit in front of the manual one for a few hours and slowly ramp up the temperatures manually. I set the automatic melting point apparatus to go to about 260 degrees Celsius with a climb rate of 7 degrees Celsius per minute. Each one can hold three melting point tubes. I did a standard of pure caffeine, crude, and then sublimated crude for the first batch. After a short amount of time, the samples begin to melt, and we got our data out. The next three samples that were ran was a pure caffeine standard once again, the recrystallized crude, and the sublimated recrystallized crude. Shortly after heating, we are at the melting point, and it starts to melt. Interestingly enough, there are five phases of melting. First is there is a moistening phase, where the material begins to look like it's sweating. Then that is followed by a sinistering point, where the sweat begins to turn into a drenched material, followed by a collapsing point where the material collapses in on itself, then followed by a meniscus point where most of the material is liquid but some solid still remains, then the final which is clear point where all the material has melted. One thing to watch out for with organic compounds is that continuing to heat too high will cause them to decompose, which we can see in our melting point samples. Now with all the data for our melting points in hand, let's take a look at it. We analyze melting point by viewing the range in which the melting point took place, and how closely it is to our expected melting point. First, let's look at our standard caffeine, which has a melting point range of 236 degrees Celsius to 240 degrees Celsius, with a range of about 3.3 to 3.4 Celsius, which is expected for our pure caffeine and it has a small range to indicating high purity. Now let's look at our samples of crude. We see an extensive range starting at 144.4 degrees Celsius and ending at 220.2 degrees Celsius. This has a range of 75.8 degrees Celsius, showing a large amount of impurities. Comparing that to the sublimated crude, which has a melting point range of 156.1 to 216.6 Celsius with a given range of 60.5 Celsius. This range is smaller than the crude, but by no means pure. Now let's take a look at the recrystallized crude. This has a melting point of 226.9 degrees Celsius to 238.9, which is a range of 12 Celsius. This shows an increase in purity due to the recrystallization. The sublimated recrystallization has a melting point range of 225.6 to 238.7 degrees Celsius, with a difference of 13.1 in temperature range. Interestingly enough, the sublimated recrystallization shows less purity than the recrystallization. Even though melting point is quite simple, mistakes can be made, and it's not the only method we use to judge purity. To guarantee purity, we can use a method known as gas chromatography followed by mass spectroscopy. The first step in gas chromatography the sample is vaporized and injected into the gas chromograph. This is then carried by an inert gas through a stationary phase, separating the components based on their interaction with that stationary phase. The eluted compounds are then introduced to a mass spectrometer, where they are ionized and fragmented. The fragments produce a unique mass spectrum. By comparing these spectra to a known standard, the compounds can be identified. This makes GCMS a valuable tool. First, I loaded up two vials, one with our recrystallized and the other with the recrystallized sublimation material. I'm only doing two purity tests because we know the first two are quite impure. Also, a GCMS has a maximum working temperature. You don't want to put things into it that are outside that range, because this will cause the column to clog up, leading it to not working. So we want to avoid high boiling point materials. For GCMS analysis, you only need a small amount of material. A general rule of thumb is if you can see it, you should have enough material to analyze. Next, I dissolve the caffeine in carrier solvent. In this case, I will use dichloromethane again. 
Vials were paired in the same method for each run. I then loaded the samples into the GCMS and started the run, with the recrystallized sample first. You don't want to measure the solvent you use in GCMS, so because we are using dichloromethane, which has a pretty low boiling point, we set the initial temperature to 50 degrees Celsius, and hold it at that temperature for 2 minutes. This will cause all the dichloromethane to boil off before the mass spec starts up. Then we ramp up the temperature to 250 degrees Celsius at a climb rate of 30 degrees Celsius. At some points between the 260 and 50, the caffeine should come out. After the run, we have four peaks. Peaks show when material comes out of the column. Next up, the sublimated recrystallized sample is ran, and this time we only got one peak out. For analysis, we use a tool known as the similarity search to determine what each peaks are based on the mass detected. We have caffeine and three other compounds in the crude. The similarity search tool gives a percentage of likelihood of each fragment matching the known samples. We want samples with a high percent similarity, higher than 95%. Anything lower than 80% is most likely not that sample. All three peaks are below 80%. This means that they're most likely not what's being reported in the similarity search. Next, we can look at the caffeine sublimated and see that there's only one peak present, which is pure caffeine. Now, this does not mean that we only have caffeine in the sample. There could be other molecules in the lower boiling point range that came out with the solvent or had too high of a boiling point and did not come out at all. But by going off the data, we produced super clean caffeine.